everybody. Isaiah Grant back with another Thinking in Circles presentation on the certain wonders of the Vesica Piscus. This lecture is actually going to be really, really, really exciting because we'll be entering something that borderlines on many of the issues or topics that I've been talking on uh, on this channel. And um, pursuant to one of the next lectures that we will be getting into uh, in continuing the idea of Abraxas, this will be pretty central to the idea as well. And on the uh, idea of the Tao, yin and yang as well, though, too, uh, it could be directly implied. And uh, you'll find that a lot of the things I talk about here on this channel directly correlate. I am basically, once again, saying what I told you before telling you again in just a different way, uh, taking random shots, hoping that I meet the mark, which is for all and any that uh, come here to listen to gain uh, groundbreaking truth and groundbreaking core truths that can uh, and definitely will, if you grasp them, uh, revolutionize your life as they have mine. Um, after the Abraxas lecture, I think I will take a short moratorium on actually posting lectures on this channel um, as I will be headed back into training for another mixed martial arts uh, contest. And uh, that's going to be rigorous. That's going to be something that's going to... Um, it's going to gonna take a lot out of my time, out of my... Uh, mental ability to uh, concentrate on many other things. So I'm going to get the Abraxas lecture out of the way and then I got to head back into the cage to uh, do what I do well when I train diligently, etc, etc. Okay, so to start this lecture off without further ado, I'm going to read a quick excerpt out of the book called Anatomy of the Body of God by Frater Akkad and um, this will open up some understanding of how key and how big of a, of a mystery the Vesica Piscus actually is. And um, I personally have gained a lot of functionality within my own personal, uh, personal work if you will, by understanding more about the Vesica Piscis. And um, it's really amazing because it's a, it's a shape that swallows up not only the symbol of the alchemical work, which I'm uh, pretty sure most of you have seen, the circle with the uh, square in it, with a triangle and a, another circle that's central to the triangle um, that's made out of man and woman. It's, it's clearly stated in the uh, way to form the symbol of the alchemical opus. And uh, the symbol of the alchemical opus is uh, uh, an emblem of the individuation process. And you will see how that actually comes together here as I read to you some of these, uh, uh, some of these notes and some of these things that I've put together basically on the Vesica Piscus. But let's begin to read out of the anatomy of the body of God by Frederick Hopp. And we're going to read one quick uh, paragraph that will give some insight into what we're going to be getting into here. So he's referring to the Vesica Piscis, and he says, This figure was not only looked upon as a symbol of the three divine personae, but that part of the figure which is bound by the arcs, and the two circles, and which takes to itself one-third of each of the two generating circles, making its periphera exactly equal with that remaining to each of the two circles, all three therefore being co-equal, and in which the triangle is formed. It was naturally held from earliest times as the most sacred Christian, Christian emblem, namely that of regeneration or new birth to how the extraordinary reverence and high value attached to this symbol, it is only necessary to remember that from the 4th century onwards, all seals of colleges, abbeys, and 
other religious communities have been made invariably of this form and they continue to be made so to this day. It was also in conclusion to this most ancient emblem that Tertullian and the other early fathers speak of Christians as Pisciculi. It was called the Vesica Piscis, the fish's bladder, and named such no doubt for the same reason as led the learned Rabbi Maimonides in the 12th century when dealing with a similar religious subject to command his hearers, when you have discovered the meaning thereof, do not divulge it because the people cannot philosophize or understand that to the infinite there is no such thing as sex. And uh, I'll throw a picture up uh, of the the Vesica Piscis, and um, I I think I'll read this this last uh, paragraph here. The Vesica Piscis is intimately connected with the discovery by Augustus Caesar, as ne as narrated by Baronius, of a prophecy in one of the Sibylline books foretelling a great event coming to pass in the birth of one who should prove to be the true King of Kings. And that Augustus therefore dedicated an altar in his palace to the unknown God. And uh, I read that last paragraph because there was a, a passage in the Bible, which I will throw up on the screen, that um, deals with, I think it was Paul talking to some individuals uh, and, and basically starting a conversation that led towards the conversion of certain individuals, I guess. Um which concerned um, a an effigy that was placed with the inscription to the unknown God, okay? And um, the unknown God kind of leads to the idea of the unknown father, which is central to the... Um, a diagram that I that I uh, actually placed up in a previous lecture describing the different circles of the cosmos as the Gnostics had shown it and that central portion is actually somewhat juxtaposed and equivalent to the outer portion which uh, is the portion that describes the three or, or shows if you will the 365 luminaries if I'm not mistaken and I'm taking this all all off the top of the head memory all right um, and I'll throw up a picture of that as well though too I mean just to show how central and how important this idea is you know taking into account what it, it links to you know what I mean taking into account uh, of the weight of it okay so now uh, what I'm gonna do is first approach the uh, proto Indo-European roots on this situation a few footnotes on those that way we can kind of break into, you know, maybe maybe what are some of the uh, the implications, and I'll throw those up on the screen as well. Okay, um, let me see. And um, a quick footnote I put in here, right, is I wrote this lecture piece because uh, I had a dream that cured that cured a lot of inner conflict I was facing, and also led to my seeing the power that I consciously use to overturn a nagging situation within my working environment. Also, there was great recognition and character bonding between uh, uh, one of my superiors, superiors and I on, on, on the job site that I felt to be beneficial for future uh, uh, resolve and for, you know, for future things that were coming. And um, that, uh, that directly links to um, one of the meanings of the Hebrew, I mean the Hebrew, the Proto-Indo-European roots, one of the meanings that's, that's uh, gleaned from it, which uh, links back to a root, uh, not a root, but a symbol in the Elder Futhark. And um, I will link to that further. So the first Proto-Indo-European root that deals with the Vesic Piscis, okay, is W-E-N-1 which means to desire or strive for, okay? And um, the der some of the der derivatives include win, won't, wish, venerate, veneral, venom, and venison, okay? Um, 
I'm going to read, just for the sake of time, I'm going to read the ones that I have uh, written side notes to, all right? And um, the first one I'm going to approach is the one that has a, uh, a linking to uh, one of the runes of the Elder Futhark, and this rune has some very, uh, I put that it has some very limbic brain overtones if we can remember what the limb how the limbic brain links us to social groups links us to society links us to situations that involve our surroundings with others okay um and and emotions as well too but anyways um wunjo um which is uh linked to the word win and winsome um from old english win when pleasure joy okay wunjo um, in the in the elder Futhark actually links to the idea of joy, links to the idea of happiness, of things coming around full circle, happiness, etc. Okay, so Wunjo, this is actually an elder Futhark rune that has meaning central to the reason why I went into this lecture as prompted from a dream. The rune meanings are actually occurring in my day as far as ten for. 22 is concerned. I wrote that down like really in a state of like kind of amazement because uh, of how things turned out. I'm not going to turn around and divulge the whole situation here because we'll eat up too much time uh, for the rest of the lecture. Okay. So um, the idea of the word wean from Old English winning to expect, imagine, think. Okay. Also wish to desire, wish, of course, right? Uh, the Vanir, the Old Norse Vanir, and these were gods associated with fertility, wisdom, and the ability to see into the future, which is foreknowledge. That's a Promethean thing, okay? They also, uh, they are also possessors of the sacred mead. Um, Freya is said to be a god, the goddess of the Vanir, okay? And Freya will come to find links to uh, a deity that's central to the idea of the Vesica Piscis, who is, um, oh man, my memory is suffering tonight, um, which is, and I have it written down over here, do, 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 Vesta, okay, Vesta, which is linked also to uh, he, the Greek Hestia as well too, Vesta is the Roman version of the Greek Hestia. So, when to to beat or wound, okay? A wound is usually accrued, I wrote on the side here, through contact with the numinous. For example, Paul's thorn in the, f the flesh in 2 Corinthians 12, 6 through 8. Also, Jacob's injury in the hollow of his thigh after wrestling with the angel, Genesis 32, 24, uh, also verse uh, through 25, and also verse 32, right, which are pretty central to the idea. We could carry the idea of Jacob's wrestling with the angel into the roots that follow, which definitions offer a perfect frame to project some very fitting ideas, but I will spare their entry in interest of time and topic. And I said that because there are a lot of the roots that follow an ideological procession linked to the idea of, of uh, uh, what that, you know, the wounding of the ego really because that the, the ego takes a blow when the 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 powers of the numinous come in like the the ego the ego suffers basically you know what i mean and uh that's the infantile ego that um uh, much much of which has to be sacrificed in order to enter into uh true individuation okay or even true initiation one of the um uh, first initiation rites in uh, certain Masonic settings is basically where you're, you know, from from what I've been told, shown, whatever, right, is that you're locked away in a, a casket and held there for, I think, either 24 to 48 hours, and it represents a death and a and a raising again into life, you know what I mean? And you're, and if you think about being stuffed inside of a coffin for such a long time, you're, you are going to receive a situation where your consciousness will probably, uh, 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 you'll probably 
leap into different states of consciousness, you know, um, your, your mind will be racing with certain fears possibly, you know what I mean? It, it will be a, a, a conscious changing situation. You see what I'm saying? So, um, when the ego dies, it opens up a chance in a situation where new consciousness can enter in. Okay. So I say all that to say that. Okay. So, um, Okay, so we're going to get into the idea of the Greek goddess Vesta, okay, as, as is related to the Vesica Piscis, okay. And I wrote here as a side note, this deity is noted because it offers a modern look into Hestia, okay, so Hestia of the Greeks, and Vesta being the Roman version or Roman variety of Hestia, and Freya also, and the idea of the Vanner, which we which we were reading about as linked to W E N Proto Indo European root, the Vanner have something to do with that, okay? And thus links to I E root W E N one to desire strive for. And lastly then, but most importantly, the Vesica Piscis, of which in latter times the Vesica uh, was a sign used by Christians to identify themselves, and it also became the cross. Okay, that's another little side note. And um, keep in mind, too, that uh, ictus, ictus, okay, um, which the numbers in Hebrew gematria, and I'm going to throw up the, the actual number because you'll see how there are certain things, certain ideas that will pop up within the, the ideological process of the numbers 1 through 11, so 483 through 494, it's going to open up. A little bit of an understanding of the Vesica Piscis, the symbolism, possibly what it means. Some light will be shed on that as we continue in this lecture and as you see what so, some more of these things are about here in, in, in direct relation to the Vesica Piscis, okay? So Vesta is the virgin goddess of hearth, home, and family in Roman religion. She was rarely depicted in human form and was more often represented by the fire of her temple in the Forum Romanum. Entry to her temple was permitted only to her priestess, her priestesses, the Vestal Virgins, who guarded particular sacred objects within, prepared flour and sacred, sacred, uh, sacred salt for official sacrifices. Now, they, they just, sacred salt, salt, for instance, right, has the idea alchemically of fire within it, okay? So linking uh, Vesta to salt, okay? Uh, salt, when you think of salt, you think of table salt, you know what I mean? There's there's the idea of fire and thus also the prima materia in alchemy within that. And the thing is, is as you press on towards uh, individuation and as uh uh, you gain some measure of uh, triumph over the infantile ego, what you notice is that what you thought that you were going to lose by sacrificing the infantile ego with its youthful attributes, but also its toxicity, what ends up happening through the poison of that serpent, there is also life and a, a, a vibrancy that is given to you. Um, almost in the the sense of a fountain of youth that that springs up within you that uh is ever growing as you continue embarking upon that path okay so continuing forward after the sacred soul okay for so um they guarded particular sacred uh, uh, objects the virgins right within um prepared flour and sacred salt for official Sacrifices intended Vesta's sacred fire at the temple hearth. Their virginity was thought essential to Rome's survival. If uh, found guilty of unchastity, they were punished by burial alive. As Vesta was considered a guardian of the Roman Empire, her, fest her festival, the Vestalia, uh, which is the 7th through 15th of June, was regarded as one of the most important Roman holidays. Mind you, the 7th through 15th of June is um, in the time of Gemini, and Gemini represents the conjunction of opposites. And a third thing being 
brought forth through the conjunction of those opposites, okay? And then that is an attainment. And it was regarded as one of the most important Roman holidays. During the Vestalia, privileged matrons walked barefoot through the city to the temple where they presented food offerings. Such uh, was Vesta's importance to the Roman religion that followed the rise of Christianity, uh, that, that following the rise of Christianity, all right? Hers was one of the last non-Christian cults still active until it was forcefully disbanded by the Christian Emperor Theodosius in A.D. Uh, 391. So, continuing forward. The myths depicting Vesta and her priestesses were few. The most notable of them were tales of miraculous impregnation of a virgin priestess by a phallus appearing in the flames of the sacred hearth. The manifestation of the goddess combined with a male supernatural being. In some Roman traditions, Rome's founders, Rom Romulus and Ramus, and the benevolent king Servius Tullius were conceived in this way. Vesta was among the Dia Consentis, 12 of the most honored gods of the Roman pantheon. She was the daughter of Saturn and Ops, and sister of Jupiter, Neptune, Pluto, Juno, and Ceres. Her, her Greek equivalent is Hestia. Uh, this virgin, yet not so virgin birth, sets her as the equivalent to the Virgin Mary. Now, we need to think about what was just stated here in the with the lenses on our eyes, okay, of looking at the fact that when you bring the unconscious and the conscious together, there's a transcendental function that occurs and that transcendental function will lead to a new birth. The ellipse that's formed by the creation of, uh, 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 or the, the, ellipse that's, that, the ellipse that is formed by the two circles combining, the ellipse that occurs in the center by the two overlapping circles, is a yoni symbolism that is created by male and female okay male and female ideas you know and um that is uh the birth of the magical child in some ways as can be stated okay and that is a virgin birth that is a birth that happens within an individual that is taking on the steps the necessary steps uh practically and uh, is doing so consciously within the individuation process, okay? So uh, Ovid derived Vesta from Latin V stando, standing by power. Cicero supposed that the Latin name Vesta derives from the Greek Hestia, which Cornetus claimed to have derived from the Greek Hestanae, the uh, Pantos, which is standing forever. This etymology is offered by Servius as well. Another etymology is that Vesta derives from the Latin Vestio, which means to clothe, as well as from Greek Estia, which means hearth and equals focus, urbis. None except perhaps the last are probable. Um, George Dumézil, a French comparative philologist, uh, surmised that the name of the goddess derives from Proto-Indo-European root H-E-U via the der derivative form H-E-U-S, which alternates to H-W-E-S, and I put a, foot mark, a footnote by that, but I'm going to finish reading here. The former is found in Greek huni, hue, huen, Latin urit ustio and vidic osatai, all conveying burning, hmm, all conveying burning, you know, burning fire being the, the element that represents the libido, the energy that uh, continues to push forward the individuation process, okay? And it's found as residing within the name of an ultra-feminine deity. So you see male and female components being united as one here in this situation, conscious and unconscious in one, okay? So, and, and then that's the Vasica Piscis there. So continuing, Greek, uh, so... The conveying of that word burning is found in Vesta. Greek goddess named Estia. Hestia is probably unrelated. See also Gallic Celtic Visk, 
which means fire. Okay, um, okay, I'm gonna go to my footnote, and an old Spanish saying says, "Huespedes y muertos hieren en la tercer día." Yes, and the dead stink on the third day. Latin root of Hestia links so well with Vesta and the IE root WES or H1WES shows the maternal function of Hestia and Vesta well in long standing Spanish saying as a home clothing the night as a stay, for instance, the womb, uh, the city the number three, and the grave, which are all feminine ideas that encompass and enshroud a body. So you're looking at a, a mother. You're looking at a, um, a, a vesture. You're looking at a veil. But within this veil, there is something that is emerging, which is a child. There's a divine pregnancy. There's, a, a, there's something that is coming from this being because also too the name is a name of fire okay which is a male attribute a male aspect okay that is uh, um, inseminating without actually doing this in a, in a in a physical way if you will and the fact that it's not doing it in the the the, the more mechanical physical way is showing that it is a divine or immaculate conception and this is something that happens within the psyche of an individual okay during the individuation process as aforementioned now uh, this is pretty important too Vesta was collect connected to liminality and the li the limit the threshold was sacred to her brides were careful not to step on it else they commit sacrilege by kicking a sacred object Servius explains that it would be poor judgment for a virgin bride to kick an object sacred to Vesta, a goddess that holds ch uh, chastity sacred. On the other hand, it might be it might merely have been because Romans considered it bad luck to trample any object sacred to the gods. In Plautus Cassina, the bride Cassina is cautioned to lift her feet carefully over the threshold following her wedding so she would have the upper hand in her marriage. Likewise, Cotylus cautions a bride to keep her feet over the threshold with a good omen. In Roman belief, Vesta was present in all weddings and so was Janus. And we've spoken about Janus earlier, okay, in uh, other lectures on this page. Vesta was the threshold and Janus was a doorway. Similarly, Vesta and Janus were invoked in every sacrifice. It has been noted that because they were invoked so often, the evocation of the two came to simply mean to pray. In addition, Vesta was present with Janus in all sacrifices as well. It has also been noted that neither of them were consistently illustrated as human. Okay? Just, just as we could see in the image of the Vesica Piscis, it's a male and feminine circle that come together to make an ellipse that is feminine. But in most of these virgin births, the child is masculine. So, 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 so you see a, a, a complete combination of masculine and feminine almost ad infinitum, okay? Um... So let's see. Um, Servius explains. Okay, no, no, we we read that already. Sorry. Um, similarly, Vesta and Janus were evoked in every sacrifice. We read that um, they were invoked so often that it it almost seemed like their names uh, uh, were synonymous with to pray. Okay. Um, Vesta was present with Janus in all human sacrifices, and they were. Um, consistently, not, neither of them were consistently illustrated as human. This has been suggested as evidence of their ancient italic origin because neither of them were fully anthropomorphized. Uh, depicted as a good-mannered deity who never involved herself in the quarreling of other gods, Vesta was ambiguous at times due to her contradictory association with the phallus. Once again, we're seeing it, okay? She is considered the embodiment of the phallic mother, 
by proponents of 20th century psychoanalysis, she was not only the most virgin and clean of the gods, but was addressed as mother and granted fertility. Mythographers tell us that Vesta had no myth save being identified as one of the oldest gods who was entitled to preference in veneration and offerings over all other gods. Unlike most gods, Vesta was hardly depicted directly. Nonetheless, she was symbolized by her flame, the fire stick, and a ritual phallus, which was called the fascinus. While Vesta was the flame itself, the symbol of the phallus might refer to Vesta's function in fertility cults, but it may be also invoked the goddess herself due to its relation to the fire stick used to light the sacred flame. She was sometimes thought of as a personification of the fire stick, which was inserted into a hollow piece of wood and rotated in a phallic manner to light her flame. Now, this reminds me, I wrote this footnote here, this reminds me of the idea of the lingam and yoni, and we talked about that in a previous lecture, and is symbolic of Shiva and Shakti energies, which are always seen united together, okay? And this is the whole idea of the Vesicopiscus right here in front of us again, okay? So, we're, 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 we're using myth to link to understand symbolism here understand more of the symbolism okay so i'm going to get into now a reading from freud and dreams as relates to the vesica piscis the shape of which could imply past and future the central point point the central portion created by the eclipse which is the present okay the present always being that which is birthing something forth, okay? It can also be taken to imply by shape all manner of opposites in unison for that matter, but for the purposes of serious dream and vision work, I will use the opposites in seeming of past and future. <clears throat> so this is basically going to guide us uh, in, in a real prima facie, quick understanding of... Um, the idea of dreams and and um, how dreams are influenced by things that happen 24 to 48 hours in 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 the in the the day of the dream you know 24 24 hours day before 48 hours two days before the, those information will show up in the dream of that night if you will you know what i mean uh, uh, at the end of the 48 hours or at the end of the 24 hours. Usually you can you can find something that relates to something that happened just the day before, but I'm going to go a little bit further with this as we get to the end. The latent content, so this is from Freud's uh, uh, psychology here. The, late, the latent content in a dream reading refers to the symbolic meaning of a dream that lies behind the literal content of the dream. The hidden meaning of dreams played an important role in Sigmund Freud's psychoanalytic theory. He also believed that bringing the hidden meaning of a dream into conscious awareness could relieve psychological distress. Yes, indeed. Something called newly encoded memories are related to what Freud, 1900s, called the day's residues in that they reflect some daytime activities of the dreamers. So this refers to dream content as refers to things that happened the day before or in the day that leads up to the dream. Temporarily stored up memories denoted as the dream lag effect offer another window into a patient's recent life. Long-term memory is correlated with remote events, implying that dream content may harken back to early experiences, for example, childhood trauma. Remote memory may even involve information collected over the course of evolution and reflected in typical dream themes such as flying or being, and being chased. Freud stated in his book, Interpretation of Dreams, as though to counterbalance the excessive part which is played in our dreams by the impressions of childhood, many authors assert that the majority of dreams reveal elements drawn from our most recent experiences. Robert, which is somebody in his circle, uh, uh, even declares that the normal dream generally occupies itself only with the impressions of the last few days. We shall find indeed that the theory of dreams advanced by Robert absolutely requires that our oldest impressions should be thrust into the background and our most recent ones brought to the fore. However, the fact here stated by Robert 
is correct. This I can confirm from my own investigations. Nelson, an American author, holds that the impressions received in dreams most frequently date from the second day before the dream or from the third day before it, as though we can no as though the impressions of the day immediately preceding the dream were not sufficiently weakened or remote. We can do we and I wrote this footnote. We can choose to be so short-sighted as to only look a few days backwards, but I have found that it is very elucidating in dream work to find content related that dates much further back. And I will reveal this with my method at the end of the readings. In chapter 5 of the same book, Freud states the opinions of previous writers on the relations of dreams to waking life and the origin of the material of dreams have not been given here. We may recall, however, three peculiarities of the memory in dreams which have been often noted, noted but never explained, and I only mention one of them because it's central to what we're reading right here, that the dream clearly prefers the impression of the last few days Robert Strumpel Hildebrandt, also Weed Hallam, have something to say to that effect. The other two are not mentioned due to the fact that I would just like to show how the few day theory was very tightly clung to in Freud's circle. Okay. So, continuing forward, Freud 1900 realized that dream content is derived from. Uh, but not identical to real life. Thus, he suggested that some transformation and connection must exist between these materials. He, con he contended that these connections are not random, but rather constrained by one's unconscious desires, such that a dream is the fulfillment of a wish. He also found that disagreeable dreams see more widespread than pleasant dreams, Hence, his hypothesis that dreams can disguise their true purposes, for example, indirectly fulfilling wishes. Freud, therefore, identified two types of dreams, manifest dream and latent dream. He stated that the latent dream is the real dream, and the goal of the dream interpretation is to reveal it. The latent dream, I, I wrote as a, a note here, is the real dream, the underpinnings being symbolic. Yes, I agree as instinct follows out of archetype and dreams are of a definite archetypal nature which is sometimes blatantly expressed as in dreams had uh, as in dreams had when the libido is regressive yet under normal circumstances uh, the archetype is there but needs to be searched for more carefully and, and 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 the thing is, is like if if your libido is regressed, you have a dream. A lot of times, it's they're they're gonna take on, it, it, especially when when the self is trying to guide you through such a hard situation. It's you're gonna have dreams that have that take on almost prophetic type of uh, imagery. I've had dreams like that that have really really guided me. Uh, um, one of these days here on this channel, I think I'm going to take some time to just purely go through some of those dreams that I've had uh, as, as they, they had been of a very elucidating nature to me on my uh, uh, journey towards uh, greater light and individuation. Okay, So these, sightings, these citations covered the role of the days before a dream, but let's look now at the day of and possibly the implications of what they mean to exposing the future, possibly through synchronicity, as explained by Carl Jung, who, as most know, used to be Sigmund Freud's apprentice in 1912. So C.G. Jung in Collected, Collected Works 8 states, synchronicity therefore contains two factors. Um, an unconscious image comes into consciousness either directly for example, literally or indirectly in the form of a dream, idea, or premonition. An objective situation coincides with this content. The one is as puzzling as the other. How does the unconscious image, image arise and how the coincidence and the unconscious image and the coincidence um, during one of my active imagination periods, because uh, it's something that you can do when you're just sitting around and got nothing better to do and you really want to go within and discover something. I've come to find that at times, active imagination will give you premonitionary insight, uh, sometimes in the form of a story. And then you'll find that 
very closely down the road something actually happens it's like dude this is exactly what this uh act of imagination was showing me and i had a situation very quickly that occurred where i was sitting uh barbecuing in the backyard there was a uh uh little act of imagination series that i had in which uh, a bum came by and he was supposed to uh uh he he came and asked me if he could use my um my barbecue and I told him, yeah, you know what? At first I was going to tell him, hell no. Then I was like, you know what? Go ahead. You can use it as long as you don't steal it or mess it up, you know? Um, so what ended up happening is just as I thought, he, he ended up going down the, the alleyway and stealing the dang barbecue, right? Um, what happened shortly was a guy that I knew who came dressed in some really bummy attire, um, almost the same as, as this individual in this in this act of imagination came over uh brought some meat unannounced cooked the meat and it it trumped the cooking that i had going for that day his food totally outdid mine and basically the dream was speaking in roundabout as if terminology saying he was he stole the grill so Basically, undertaking a, a active imagination, receiving uh, visions from the unconscious can. It, 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 there is a question of whether it, whether it is the cause of what is going to happen, or whether that was going to happen anyways. But you gain a window of insight whether it is going to happen or whether it is not. But I think that there's also input that you can give to actually making certain things happen through visionary uh, uh, impulse, basically forcing visions and emotions into the unconscious, if you will, right? Almost injecting these things into the unconscious and seeing how they will throw a synchronicity on the outside. Um, my delving into the occult long ago shows me that that is what they term as lesser magic you know what i mean um but anyways i'm not going to get too far off the, off the subject we're going to continue reading here okay um an objective situation coincides with this content the one is as puzzling as the other how does the unconscious image arise and how the coincidence just what i was talking about there I understand only too well why people prefer to doubt the reality of these things. Here I will only pose the question. Later in the study I will try to answer it. What then happens is a kind of creatio ex nihilo. And I wrote a footnote on that. Uh, uh, creatio ex nihilo means creation out of nothing from the Latin, okay? An act of creation that is usually, uh, that is not casually explicable. The mantic procedure, mantic dealing with the mind, owe their effectiveness to the same connection with emotionality. Now, this is key, okay? Mental power, and I wrote a, a footnote to this, mental power plus emotional center power and motivation, mantic, has to do with mancy, of which there are sorts, uh, uh, ver various sorts of mantic or mancy, if you will, right? For example, geomancy, necromancy, cartomancy, etc. So herein is a formula for active imagination, dream work, also as far as expectancy of a conscious result is concerned. So, so without Jung stating it there, I mean, he's very closely showing how, how synchronicity possibly can be caused to happen, okay? So, um, we were talking about how these creations from nothing come by the mental procedures or, you know, uh, uh, getting visions, if you will, and emotionality, right? Okay. So by touching an unconscious aptitude, they stimulate interest, curiosity, expectation, hope, and fear, and consequently evoke a corresponding preponderance of the unconscious, okay? And that's also the way to enter those states, to be expectant of some type of result when you're in uh, a perfect, calm, 
looking into the darkness of your mind many times imagery will be right there you just weren't expecting it, or you were doubting it you're concentrating too much on your doubts and the fact is is that they were there playing you, you we, we, we are all dream you're dreaming right now i'm dreaming right now there, there's a ticker tape just like a movie going in my head right now and it's responsible for certain thoughts certain feelings um certain and, and, and keep in mind that this imagery is cons constantly changing it's morphing and and this this links to the idea of proteus in uh um i think proteus was uh either roman or greek mythology in the way that he's a shapeshifter also not not only proteus mercury as well though too because mercury is a shape-shifting deity as well though too taking on many different forms and, and the key is to grasp these forms grasp their archetypes see what the symbology is behind it look deeper into these things and typify these things but also to know that they're just um messages that the self is trying to give you and uh, uh, in anchoring them that way you won't identify totally with them you won't play so far or too much uh, uh, into some of the possibly negative uh, visions that you may see or me negative dreams that you may have you see what I'm saying meaning that that if, if you do it in that fashion in that form there's always something to gain that you can extract and that you can pull that self value from even things that are poison and that's the whole idea behind uh, 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 Hermes or Mercurius is that he's the god that heals that 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 brings about the panacea which is the the all healing medicine but he is also the poisoner too you see so we're gonna continue reading here because we have a few pages to read here the effective numinous agents in the unconscious are the archetypes, <clears throat> but by far the greatest number of the spontaneous synchronistic phenomena that I have had occasion to observe and analyze can easily be shown to have a direct connection with an archetype. Okay, that's very, very big because you can symbolize, you can... can link back you can and that that's an idea of conjunction linking something back so you can anchor it so you can hold it down and observe it and see what it falls into relation with as far as other ideas are concerned you know so you can basically get a beat on it you know archetypes keep in mind they're not so easy to just pin down because if you and if you do try to pin them down just like quicksilver just like mercury they'll slip right out of your hands so this is another big thing to, to think about when approaching these type of ideas. You know, you have to take a very loose, very as if this is speaking in this type of as if language. Um, you have to take a very loose yet systematic approach to it. OK, this the archetype in itself is an irrepresentable psychoid factor of the collective unconscious the latter psychoid factor cannot be localized since either it is complete in principle in every individual or is found to be the same everywhere you can never say with certainty whether what appears to be going on in the uh, uh, collective unconscious of a single individual is not also happening in other individuals or organisms or things or situations so uh, let's see the equal significance of parallel events if and it seems plausible the meaning the meaningful coincidence or cross connection of events cannot be explained causally then the connecting principle must lie in the equal significance of parallel events in other words their tertium compare compare is meaning so the, the 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 basically the third thing that it compares to but also to the way that these things juxtapose and i use that word a lot the way that they juxtapose with one another the way you can draw lines of comparison from one thing to the other that that that's why uh for instance the tarot can be used uh, uh to do things like that to typify things the the hebrew kabbalist tree of life can be made and it could be used to make comparisons across the board and if i'm able to look at the runes of the elder foothark for instance right that's a system that uh uh 
has archetypal ideas embedded within it because I can link it back to other systems that have archetypal underlyings as well. So um, there are many different symbolic sets. I, the I Ching as well, though, too, links back to other symbolic ideas and sets as well, too. You know what I mean? So it, it's good to have one, two, three, a few, or just one of those sim uh, understanding of one of those symbolic sets in your arsenal so that you can apprehend what the unconscious is trying to show you in realms of vision, dreams, etc. Okay? So, continuing forward, the psychoid reference <clears throat> aforementioned is referred to the collective unconscious from whence the archetypes interface with our, ves our vessels of consciousness. The archetypal nature and energy is the instinctive guiding force of all things and is found to be such in animals, human consciousness, and group activities. And at bottom, it is the reason for events that happen in large-scale situations, i.e. world events, historical events, group situations, down to the individual events and situations, all the way down to the specific individual uh, uh, individuals involved in them. Knowledge of the archetypes may help one to find a way to deduce how the archetype may unfold into another situation in the future, which is where I link this to the understanding of the opposite circle of the vesica that encloses the present while eclipsing the opposite circle in its construction, which corresponds to the past. There also exist other correspondences to the meaning of these parts of the vesica piscis or the circle or part of the Sycopiscus and also their positions which I will approach here shortly after the mention of the fish symbolism and its magnetizing aspect as I believe is implicit in the idea of the Sycopiscus and I will also approach some of the symbolism of the Vesica as it relates to the conjunctio and also an altar name it is termed by which will shed more light on its value in your personal work as it has in my very own okay so I'm gonna go back to a, a, a key note that I made here where I talk about one of the portions of the circle pertaining to the idea of the past that's what we're gonna how we're gonna term it because and, and we and we can do so because the woman the feminine circle represents water mother but it's also something that represents to the past the male side of it linking to the future in some ways we can we can kind of term those portions of the uh, the uh, symbol and utilize it that way to gain some type of result, if you will. So the past, because the time one can spend in prayer, ritual, wishing, desire, projecting, expectations, etc. Okay, even if that does succeed, I, and I and I believe that those ends might, as I've had some real encounters of numinous kind always must recede into the past in our linear time recognizing consciousness okay because our time is always recognizing uh, 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 linear time our, our, our minds are always recognizing how things are coming into time okay until uh, at a future date or even some minutes later synchronistically what we saw in a dream or vision prayed for performed a ritual for is before us in the form of an exact answer or sign pointing to where we can find the answer, etc. at the present yet future in comparison with the beginning point of origin. So the thing is, is we can pray for things uh, if you're a religious person. I'm, I, I know for a fact that you've prayed for something and boom, the answer is right there. Or if you've dreamed about something and wow, man, I'm having deja vu. This is, you know, I've, or I've been here before. Oh man, this is something I dreamed about last night. You know, uh, things from the unconscious are constantly breaking their way into consciousness. And I believe this is because time is an illusion and we're only looking at time being chopped up and broken up because, yes, we have the implement of time as far as like uh, our, our idea of timing on a watch, for instance, right? But the con consciousness, the left side of the brain is always consistently and constantly breaking up bits of information so that it can understand things, okay? And and, and that's where I believe we get our concept of time for from because... When you're on the right side of the brain, when you're in trance, time seems to pass uber quickly. Um, and that can, if, if you cannot bring yourself into trance, for instance, or into a state of dream, when you're in a state of dream, time, it, like, 
it seems like in the dream, maybe you were there for hours, but uh, uh, when you, you know, or, or not even hours, like maybe sometimes it will seem like, you know, maybe it was 15 minutes, but you wake up and you see that maybe six hours have passed that you've been sleeping. You know, there's a compression of time, which I've spoken of in another uh, lecture. I believe that that we're that if we pay attention, we're, we're, we can see the truth that time is actually an illusion and that all that there really is, is now. Past is now. The future is now. When I'm doing a comp, when I'm usually doing competitions, uh, especially competitions where I have to go and fight several people in one night, right, or one day during the competition, um, it's a very stressful situation. Okay, and um, a lot of times, I, I what helps me get through having to wait. The waiting is the hardest part. Is I tell myself it's already happened. It's already. The, the 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 fight's already done the the, the 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 situation's already been completed it's already over with you know what i mean either you've won or you lost the only problem that you're facing and the only situation that you're having right now with anxiety is that you don't know what the outcome is going to be and that's that's always what it is but the truth is it's already done it's finished it is finished okay so we're going to go on to the next page of reading. Okay, so we're going to talk about the Vesica Piscis and the Remora, the, e the Echeneus Remora. And this is going to get into magnetism, more, more into the phenomena that deals with how things are brought into the real world, if you will, from the more numinous unconscious plane, okay, into into actual being, how the formless becomes form and an alchemical idea on what the formula of that would have been, okay? So I'm going to start reading here. <clears throat> In a treatise of the 7th century by an anonymous French, French author, our strange hybrid the round fish finally becomes a veritable, uh, verifiable vertebrae known to zoo zoology. The sucking fish. Sucking. I said sucking. The sucking fish. Echeneus remora is the, the common remora or sucking fish. It belongs to the mackerel family and is distinguished by a large, flat, oval-shaped sucker on the top of the, the head in place of the dorsal fin. By means of this, it attaches itself either to a larger fish or to a ship's bottom, and in this wise is transported about the world. Now, we got to think about this. This fish, and this is kind of where this is going to link to the Taoist idea of doing without doing, okay? The idea of the Tao, and because I'm a martial artist, I can speak on this. In Judo, the idea of Judo is, is a, a, a minimum effort maximum efficiencies this is exactly what this fish is doing it's going with the flow it's riding the wave it's in that flow state and the thing is 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 it's 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 linking to something else that's doing the work in order for it to get where it needs to go and when you have consistently been able to elicit manifestation power from the unconscious which some people may be rolling their eyes like that's not even realistic great if you don't believe in it then you or, or if you won't even try to empirically approach whether that is a possibility then you miss out i think on one of the most amazing things in life that show you that you are actually linked to something higher that you're you're not just a powerless human being you see and, and that's what this idea is going to get into here, okay? So, the alchemical fish symbol, the Echeneus, clearly derives from Pliny. But fishes also crop up in the writings of Sir George Ripley. What is more, they appear in their messianic role. Together with the birds, they bring the stone. Just as in Oxyrhynchus... Oxyrhynchus saying of Jesus, 
it is the fowls of the air and the fishes of the sea and whatsoever it is upon or beneath the earth that point the way to the kingdom of heaven the motif of the helpful animals okay and something that popped up into my brain i had to write a, a little footnote here is the salmon is a good fish to think of here as it swims upstream to lay its eggs keep in mind the closeness of the indo-european roots to sanskrit for example the roots uh, the the Indo-European root L A K S salmon is reminiscent of Lakshmi, and keep in mind Indo-European is close to Sanskrit. Okay, um, is reminiscent of Lakshmi, Hindu goddess of wealth, fortune, power, beauty, fertility, and also prosperity associated with Maya illusion. And also remember uh, Indo-European root W A N for Venus and Vasica Piscis are there. Um, Lakshmi forms a triad of goddesses representing the feminine aspects of creation, preservation, and destruction. For example, as one, this is Parabrahman, the supreme being, this would also link her to the trigunas or three qualities of matter, yet as a goddess she would not be affected by them. She is said to be the creative energy of Vishnu who is Narayana. Okay, now um, this this feminine trimurti version of the trimurti um, are linked to uh, uh, a great goddess mother that is uh, uh, a feminine version of Parabrahman. Okay, so you can look at Parabrahman as the trimurti and the uh, um, the portion that Lakshmi of, of the other two deities that Lakshmi is uh, linked to as the feminine version of the Trimurti which are which have a linking a direct linking to the Trigunas the Trigunas being the three principles of batter sat, Sadvikas or Sadva Rahas Tamas okay which are very important to go into if you want to understand how even matter is linked to the one the one highest deity if you will right the one highest energy we you know matter is is light energy at the end of the day it's it, it it's it it's all formed and, and held together by atomic atom right or atom in egyptology that's the 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 first main head head god okay it's it, it's all held together by energy that's vibrating at certain intervals thus you have viscous matter and thus you have supremely firm and dense matter okay but it's all linked by one principle which is the atom or and then that's the physical energy construct that represents a higher a higher spiritual construct or hierarchy if you will you know that that permeates things all the way down to the lowest level okay so um continuing on about the echa the echinaeus remora so in lamb springs symbols the zodiacal fishes that move in opposite directions symbol symbolize the arcane substance okay um unconscious self manifests itself through the animal impulses this is the next little portion we're going to read on this all this theriomorphism right which is uh deities or energies being represented as uh animals okay um all this theriomorphism is simply a visualization of the unconscious self manifesting itself through animal impulses okay and we, we, we just got done saying earlier that uh, archetypes will show up through the animal impulses, i.e. the instincts, okay? So we can kind of trace some instinctual act, okay? Or some instinctual longing or some instinctual desire that's at the bottom of our uh, uh, fabric of being to... An archetype to uh, a deity to some energy that will give us a deeper explanation of of where we're at with that okay so 
continuing forward. Some of these can be attributed to uh, uh, known instincts, but for the most part, they consist of feelings of certainty, beliefs, compulsions, idiosyncrasies, and phobias that may run directly counter to the so-called bio biological instincts without necessarily being pathological on that account. Okay, so so. To, 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 to have these certain things that are running through you like this, these animal impulses, it doesn't mean you're crazy, okay? In other words, okay? Because it, it can be linked back to something that may just be intrinsic to your personal being, your own intrinsic sense of self, okay? Wholeness is perforce paradoxical in its manifestation and the two fishes going in the opposite directions or the cooperation of birds and fishes are an illustrative uh, instruction instructive illustration of this the arcane substance as its attributes show refer to the self and so in the oxy rinka sayings does the kingdom of heaven or the conjectural city okay these refer to the self and i wrote a footnote on this ask and i started with a question where is the kingdom of heaven this is the key to understanding much of this riddle in seeming. What the, the mental nature slack slash sex is the city. What, what mental, of what mental nature or sex is the city? Um, this will answer where the magnetism is in the body and mind as well. And I speak of the energy body. Now here's the answer. Is the city not a virgin bride to her husband and this is this is in the scriptural the scriptural idea of these things you see what i'm saying because the scripture is full of archetypal symbolism that uh uh and and parables etc cetera, etc cetera. jesus spoke to his disciples in parables and uh, uh some sometimes he even spoke to them openly but to people in the crowd people that weren't ready for it he spoke in parables which were archetypal if you knew the symbolism you'd be able crack open that nutshell so continuing forward the echinaeus exercises an attraction on ships that could best be compared with the influence of a magnet on iron the attraction so the historical tradition says emanates from the fish and brings the vessel whether powered by sail or 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 oarsman to a standstill so if you think about this in terms of the psyche there are certain things that you'll be walking around in life uh or certain thoughts you may have that may come from nowhere like a like a, a lightning bolt out of the blue and strike you in your psyche and you'll stop it will stop you in your tracks right there's certain situations that you have been visualizing and emotionalizing over and projecting maybe if you don't even know that you were doing that with your will and all of a sudden you see a synchronicity and you stop in your tracks this is in a large way what this is talking about but it's also describing some other situations okay how 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 there's magnetism in the psyche of the human individual but it's something that you have to awaken to and most of us humans are not human we're still bound by animal desires and everything else so the truth is is if you're at a point in your development where you should receive this knowledge and be able to utilize this knowledge towards great ends and results you will do so and you shall if not you are going to listen to what it is that is being said uh, that have been recapitulated and I actually this is a recapitulation because I'm talking about something that somebody that is is long deceased said long ago and he's he's talking about something that people long deceased at his time were talking about it's going to be looked at by people that are still stuck under their animal nature totally as foolishness okay and 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 so be it and so be it they 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 will not reap the the boon or the reward and so mote it be so um <clears throat> anyways continuing forward 
I mention this seemingly unimportant feature because as we shall see in the alchemical view, the attraction no longer proceeds from the fish, but from a magnet, which man possesses and which exerts the attraction. That was once the mysterious property of the fish. This is Carl Gustav Jung saying this stuff, all right? Significance of the fish lichen to the magnetism of the North Pole. If we bear in mind the significance of the fish, it is easy to understand why a powerful attraction should emanate from this arcane center, which might aptly be compared with the magnetism of the North Pole. As we shall see in a later chapter, the Gnostics said the same thing about the magnetic effect of their central figure, point, the monad, the sun, etc. And that's getting into geometry once again, a, geomet a geometric figure. And if we were to look at the Physica Piscis and place it upon the symbol of the magnum opus of the alchemist, which is, uh, uh, once again, as I have before mentioned, the circle with a triangle within it, with a square within a circle, with a circle within that, okay? Um... It, it lays over it very, very uh, perfectly. It, it's, it, they're almost complementary symbols, okay? Um, so, continuing forward. It is therefore a remarkable inno innovation when the alchemists set out to manipulate an instrument that would exert the same powers as the echeneus, but on the echeneus itself. The reversal of direction is important for the psychology of alchemy because it offers a parallel to the adept's claim to be able to produce the filius macrocosmi. And that's the that that's the son of okay, so the macrocosmi, the larger cosmic creator, the larger deity, if you will, the equivalent of Christ Deo, Considente, through his art. In this way, the artifacts, alchemical artificer, or his instrument comes to replace the echeneus and everything it stood for as the arcane substance. He has, so to speak, unveiled the secret out of the fish and seeks to draw the arcane sub substance to the surface in order to prepare from it the, phili the phileus philosophorum, the lapis. And... I'm going to refer to this card later, and I actually, I think I recently did, but the 18th card of the tarot shows this with, um, with Kefara holding the solar disk and entering into the realm of the unconscious. He, 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 that energy of Kephara is actually taking that solar disk through the realm of the unconscious, the realm of the dead, if you will, into the realm of day, the realm of the living. From the west, it's going into the west from the east, back into the east. Into the realm of the dead, back into the realm of the living, you see? So uh, consciousness... And what we understand of it and where it goes and what it does and what its capabilities are, we tend, I believe, to underestimate due to our ignorance, due to our lack of knowledge of what is actually occurring. Okay, so um, continuing for the opposites and their unification are readily seen in the imagery of the Viseca Piscis, and unity of opposites is alchemical conjunctio. We can be sure that something is true insofar as it contains its opposite. This can be said for symbols or archetypes which contain their opposites within them as well. Because we are so polarized by nature, so quick to cling to one opposite or another, we easily miss the other side that we are not clinging to, and that other side is usually the unconscious. This is why when the power of an archetype is hurled upon us, or more psychologically correct, when we are under the goading of the self through an archetypal possession, whether that fills us with pleasant desire or strife, it is good for us to be aware of that energy and also think of its opposite, as identifying with it could be a disaster if our psychological vessel is not big enough to carry its energy. 
It is for this reason that many individuals fragment under the weight of archetypes they are identifying with, which, leaves, which leads to neuroses, neurosis and complexes of various natures as modern analytic psychology will attest to. So getting into the idea of the conjunctio, uh, slain by the woman's embrace. The woman who slays her husband with her, uh, her embrace appears in the ap apocryphal book of Tobit. Sarah, who is to be married to Tobias, has had seven previous husbands. This is going to get into another imagery of the fish, okay? Every wedding night when the husband retired to bed with his bride, the demon Asmodeus killed him. Seven successive husbands had died in that way. Raphael, his guardian angel, which is Mercury, okay, um, gives Tobias specific instructions on how to deal with the danger um one uh, on the way to his bride's house tobias encounters a huge fish that leads i mean that leaps out of the water at him he is instructed to kill the fish and it, it extract its heart liver and gall so the gall is what we're really focused on the gall bladder okay um on his wedding night he must burn the heart and liver in an incense protecting him from the evil demon the gall is to be uh, to uh, is to be applied to the eyes of his blind father in order to re restore his sight the symbolic idea behind this story and this is going to get into the conjunctio is that the conjunctio leads to death extinction of conscious ener uh, of consciousness until the energy of instinctu instinctual desirousness the fish has been extracted from its original form and transformed into spirit incense that is conscious understanding this interpretation is supported by a variant passage in the vulgate now um i wrote a footnote next to fish so we're gonna, I'm going to read that really quickly. If we look at the anatomy of a fish and not really fixate on the bladder, um, that's not why I'm referring to an anatomical diagram of this creature. Let's look at its brain, the shape of it, the fact that it has scales much like a snake and its brain anatomy is not so far off uh, uh, from the fish. It's actually quite identical. Fish are said to have some form of a limbic system, and science is saying that snakes slash reptiles have some measure of hippocampal structure. So this implies some form of limbic center slash system to do so, okay? I'm not here talking simply about animal anatomy, but to point to the fact that instinctual desirousness as being linked to the symbol of the fish and serpent link in the human in the basal ganglia structure and amygdala function this center in society is so repressed made so taboo it is no wonder why its functions are automatic and termed unconscious but are also included in the structure within us as well that causes lashing out society's mandates uh, civility causes us to look for sexual treats to fill a usually stimula uh, simulated or regulated appetite because society makes it so taboo a conscious understanding of what is repressed we see is a curative we may be fooled sometimes into instinctual action through the reptilian center, but I believe that we are all too often ruled out by a group consensus because of our lack of self-will into the herd mentality. Many times because of our morals as well. The herd idea, the group, is a limbic structure, mammalian idea. It is well known that the serpent brain or our complex interacts with all portions of the brain. I think that what this tract is saying here is a curative. Uh, it is for the R complex and neocortex to gain a report, basically being instinct plus intelligence. Okay, and 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 that's a a purified instinct, but not purified in a moralistic sense. Okay, because. The moralistic sense is actually what is has choked out so much of the creative value uh, uh, through through times Im immemorial or times memorable because we know when the uh, uh, event 
of moralistic enforcement came into play. And with that, I'm just going to continue on in, uh, on in the reading, but I'm also, I'm, before I just shut up about this, I'm going to um, mention something that uh, the, 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 the main founder of, of uh, the Theosophical Movement, Helena P. Blavatsky, stated that there is no religion higher than truth. Okay, religion carries along with it underpinnings of moralistic ideologies and things of that nature. And if you look at some of the symbolic ideas and in 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 ideas that even we talk about here, they would be shunned by individuals that are overpowered within their psyche by the emotional limbic system. And that is because of the way that they see things based upon not on how they really truly feel or see things, but how others have told them to, you see? So what is purification then? You know, and I, I believe that it's a weighing, and bal uh, weighing of values, balancing values, and tossing out those superfluous values that have been imposed upon you and really getting a report with more automatic centers w w within you and higher centers within you as well though too you know and, and 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 having those things working in such quick report that you're able to instantly and quickly glean from a a, a spiritual understanding in your day to day you see but um continuing for it here the gall of the fish, when applied to the eyes of Tobias' blind father, restores his sight. Gall is bitter, corresponding to the bitterness of frustrated desire. But the experience of bitterness, properly understood, uh, applied to the eyes, brings wisdom. The lesser conjunctio occurs whenever the ego identifies with contents emerging from the unconscious. This happens almost regularly in the course of the analytic process. The ego is exposed... Uh, successively to identifications with the shadow, the anima, and anim or animus, and the self. Such contaminated conjunctios must be followed by mortificatio and further separatio. And these are alchemical terms. Uh, I may throw up some, um, some um, charts that may show you some ideas that can link to mortificatio and separatio so that you can see what those those uh, uh, alchemical processes entail, okay? It'll give you a gist. A similar sequence occurs in the extroverted aspect of the process. The ego identifies with certain individuals, groups, institutions, and collectives, individual and collective transferences. These identifications are contaminated mixtures containing both the individual's potential for noble loyalties and object love and also unregenerate desires for power and pleasure. What we were talking about earlier. They must undergo further purification before the greater conjunctio is possible. So there is... Um, a linking to something that I wrote here on this. If the unconscious can be glimpsed into via dream visualizations such as active imagination and even more so if we can take advantage of such tools by which we can observe the living nature of the archetype of an archetype consciously via such things as active imagination which can be done sometimes as easily as daydreaming but in my opinion should be approached with reverence attributed to scrying then we would have more chances, more of a chance to avoid the lesser conjunctio and the mortificatio and separate, separatio to follow, increasing those chances towards the greater conjunctio. You will find, uh, uh, will be, uh, what, increasing the chances to the greater conjunctio, you will find will be uh, taking an empiric approach to the substance of your dream and active imagination material compiled from the sessions you undertake you need to put together information in order to kind of chart your pro your progress and you'll you'll find more ease in linking to a greater conjunctio which is a very mind-blowing experience okay uh, uh very conscious increasing you know 
and it's not the only conjunctio. It's a, this is something I, I really truly believe that happens uh, uh, on several greater levels. It just gets greater with time. Okay, so um, so the next portion of this is called thrown back and forth. Okay, and then I wrote a little footnote on that. I said. I will explain fully what I mean about the last sentence at the end of this lecture, yet we need to learn to occupy the middle point of situations, dreams, visions, etc. by juxtaposing and blending consciousness with unconsciousness and also to the material that comes out of those experiences. We need to add past reference as a way to anchor results. The psychotherapeutic process is likewise an alternating to approve. One is thrown back and forth between the opposites almost interminably. But very gradually a new standpoint emerges that allows the opposites to be experienced at the same time. And I put a footnote here. This comes through sitting with the opposites, holding on to the one so the other can emerge not repressing but consciously experiencing so as to not miss what can and will be learned at the interchange the threshold of Hestia the doorway of Janus for instance where the opposite is united to its counterpole okay this new standpoint is the conjunctio and it is both releasing and burdensome Jung says the one after another is a bearable prelude to the deeper knowledge of the side by side, for this is an incomparably more difficult problem. Again, the view that good and evil are spiritual forces outside of us and that a man is caught in the conflict between them is more bearable by far than the insight that the opposites are the ineradicable and indispensable preconditions of all psychic life, so much that life itself is guilt. Um, okay, and um, I put a little footnote here about the life itself is guilt portion. Today I had a fleeting thought that said, and this was before putting this together. Uh, I just had to write this in because I was like, man, I was, I was thinking about this earlier today. Today I had a fleeting thought that said, a guilty conscience, while it is a burdensome, burdensome state of mind, can be a good thing. A guilty conscience sees itself in every day, uh, seen around it, and heard around it. Or okay, a guilty conscience sees itself in everything seen around it and heard around it, as if all things are pointing back to itself. Only if it was in such a paranoid state. It would intimate perfectly the state that true Gnostic seekers find themselves in as they are seeking the divine and numinous in traces in the shadows of the, moon, the mundanities surrounding uh, them, freeing the sparks of Sophia, if you will, in prison in matter. Okay, so I'm entering this let's see I'm entering this last text to show how the conjunctio oppositorum the conjun conjunction of opposites is important and is the cause of release of great energy which can transform consciousness in other words we can actually move towards this conjunction happening by facing situations least entered upon by ourselves unfamiliar territory and things of that nature if embarked upon consciously one can invite the power of this transformative experience into one's life consciously being the key word so continue reading um, in this respect, they, they refers to Jupiter in Pisces, correspond to the symbolism of the two fishes in the zodiacal sign of Pisces. Jung also mentions the fact that a conjunction of Jupiter and Pisces in Gemini occurred in 531 AD, and he finds this synchronistically connected to the founding of the first mon monastery by St. Benedict in 529 AD. So why, why would I put this in here? This is why it goes to state further. The underlying idea is that whenever opposites come together, the conjunctio takes place and one can expect something important to happen. This was Jung's writings on that. Okay. Um, 
So uh, this listing slash reading contained many more planetary zodiacal configurations which would have served to nail this point further. However, I have placed it here to show not only Hume's interest in conjunctions in the heavens, which are prototypic of the psyche, but also his final statement, which was one that showed the belief that uh, conjunction period in the psyche, in a dream, in the individual, etc., causes something to happen. Okay? So now to get into the more important factual ideas of the uh, Vesica Piscis, which will include a diagram I have made notes on due to my personal work within using this model to understand and interact with my own personal consciousness as pertains towards the work, towards gaining ever increasing light. Okay? So um, I'm going to put up a picture of the of the uh, Vesica Piscis once again, and um, I'm going to read this footnote. It says, note that it is the overlap in two circles representative of the unity of opposites that creates the ovular structure, structure in the center, allowing for the perfect equilateral triangle to be formed within the ellipse, which can present, represent the child in the womb, the church. As I have uh, uh, read earlier, it could be a Masonic Lodge that this represents and how telling and how telling about the Masonic Lodge portion when the pillars representing the opposites sits in front of the door of the lodge, right? Boaz and Jakin are the name of the pillars which have the philosophical meaning of the equal of equal nature as the the Tai G does to the Taoist. The Tai G being the uh, uh, the Tai G two being the uh, uh, yin and yang. Okay, the triangle since it occupies the space. of two circles which could hold six triangles each, ten in their current configuration as the Vesica Piscis, if we were to position an inverted triangle beneath the uh, one shown in Euclid's elements, those two triangles in the oval would equal four-thirds if we measured the circles by the oval portion in the center in two-thirds, meaning we would consider the oval as the place of the triangle. Um, Four-thirds equals one and three-tenths equals 13 over 10. 13 uh, uh, being the, um, the numerator um, is, uh, equals, is equal in, in, um, in gematria, right, which is a Kabbalistic uh, practice of taking words and pl putting them into numbers equals achad, which is unity or one. And then uh, the, the ten, the denominator, is he. And he is the letter of Malkuth, the mother of Bana. Also, this letter means the window or window, implying here unity, triunity in all that is seen, which is the Hindu idea in truth with Brahman as the masculine and feminine and feminine trimurti, which are also oh wait, also the masculine and which which is also linked with the, the the feminine version of the trimurti, which are also the three qualities of matter. It's linked to that idea, who are above and unsullied by them. Those deities, they're linked to those ideas, but they're not sullied by. The material aspects of them okay this finding also qualifies by resounding with the doctrine of kether being in malkuth and malkuth being in kether which is equivalent to the idea of one equals ten okay because kether is one malkuth is ten malkuth is ten kether is one amazing also, amazingly also the tree of life is based upon the vasika piscis which when placed on the tree of life will reveal death, which is knowledge, or deat, knowledge, at the top of the central oval. The center would have consciousness tifereth in the middle, and at the base of the central oval, the unconscious yasad, the lunar center, is revealed. On the peripheries of the circles, the outer, upper, 
and lower Sephiroth are contained. Malkuth hangs from it like a pendant. If that is disappointing, recheck the math aforementioned. Okay? So, the Fasicopiscus, continuing the reading, Fasicopiscus is a type of lens, a mathematical shape formed by the intersection of two discs with the same radius, intersecting in such a way that the center of each disc lies on the perimeter of the, uh, of the other. In Latin, Vesica piscis literally means bladder of a fish, reflecting the shape's resemblance to the conjoined dual air bladders or swim bladder found in most fish. In Italian, the shape's name is mandorla, which means almond. Very important to the mention of fish's gallbladder. Uh, at, let me see. Um, this is linked to the story that we read of Tobit. Okay, and as the Vesica piscis is the fish's bladder. Also, the vesica links to the term almond, so also it links to the amygdala, which the neocortex sits above and the basal ganglia sits below. So it is central to animal, reptilian, and human centers, which number three in all. Uh, just as the two circles come together to form three circular portions and the triangle, which goes back to the number three, which sits in the vesica center, which is the mandorla, which is Italian uh, uh, word for almond. The Greek amygdala means almond and is the word from which we get amygdala. And um, I will link to uh, on, on the screen to <clears throat> those words um, as far as the etymology is concerned. <clears throat> So continuing reading. So we're going to talk about the symbolism of the uh, Vesica Piscis. Various symbolic meanings have been associated with the Vesica Piscis. Um, when arranged so that the lens is horizontal with its two overlaid circles placed one above the other, it symbolizes the interface between the spiritual and physical worlds represented by the two circles. In this arrangement, it also represents the ictus, fish symbol for Christ and has also been said to be a symbol of life of the materialization of the spirit of Christ's mediation between heaven and earth and of the Eucharist when arranged so that the lens is placed vertically right vertically it is uh, used to depict a halo or aureola and uh, aureola it, it represents divine glory when arranged so that the lens is placed vertically, it, it has also been said to be a depiction of the vulva and therefore symbolic of femininity and fertility. A diagram of Euclid's use of this diagram to construct an equilateral triangle appearing with the vertical placement of the lens in James Joyce's Finnegan's Wake has been said to be the emblematic, uh, has, has said to be emblematic of rational man, but overlaid onto a vaginal triangle again symbolizing femininity okay so um i made a reference to the anatomy of the body of god book by frater arcad a treatise on the kabbalistic tree of life the vesica piscis took a front seat as a proven basis of the whole scheme of the tree of life proving or showing it to be a living systems whose use could be extended into infinite realms okay now um <clears throat> there's some footnote that i put over here this information could slip by, by very easily if not amplified the horizontal vesica as a symbol of the interface between the spiritual and physical worlds is represented by alchemical conjunctio materialization of spirit and the eucharist is coagulatio alchemically as can be femininity in the realm of vulva and fertility. In coagulatio, many of the attributes of Vesta or Hestia and the attributes of the Vanir can be seen to be present in the cluster chart list. So I'm going to throw those up there and I want you to look at that because it's almost like an anchor too to show you that I'm not just rattling stuff off and just throwing stuff off there and not relating things in a proper manner, in a manner that is balanced and with measure. And uh, neither am, am I doing this to 
to sound this way or that. I just really love this type of content in how it can lead you into a pure understanding of the psyche. And I know that since it since within my own work, within myself, I've been able to really make leaps and bounds in the work. This this type of information and um, the the overlaying of systems, the understanding of this system through many other systems and symbolism through the symbolism of many other systems could possibly help. OK, yourself just as it has helped myself. So anyways, continuing in coagulatio, many of the attributes of Vesta or Hestia, also the attributes of the Vanner can be seen to be present in the cluster chart list Christ med Christ mediation between heaven and earth is slash can be looked at in a few different ways as mediation and uh, can be a standing between which uh, as he is emblematic of uh, the Ruach as a messenger from realms above to those below this is like noose which we'll possibly get into we're 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 running ahead, so I might make a uh, chop this video in half. But um, this is like news, which we'll talk about later here. The serpent who relays messages from the father to man. Mediation is also Christ in his logoic aspect, separating darkness from light, as the Egyptian shoe separated Newt from Geb in their confused, chaotic embrace in the beginning, making room for multiplicities of creations to be engendered forth. The former would be separatio linking to conjunctio, and the latter separatio linking to coagulatio the emblem of rational man soul overlaid onto a virginal triangle luna as mentioned in the symbol symbolism of the horizontal vesica is separatio and co coagulatio aspects combined too much separatio leads to conjunctio and the conjunctio if it is the greater to a transformative result if the lesser conjunctio to mortificatio for lack of consciousness and then back to separatio. So basically a death is what occurs when the lesser conjunctio occurs. A death, a conscious, a conscious death may be a, a, um, a depression, if you will, because you didn't quite get what you were wanting from a situation. Okay, because you clung too too tightly to one pair of the opposites, right? And what ends up happening, then that leads to separatio, meaning you you're you're gonna sit if you're wise enough, you will sit in that depression and chop up all the information of what happened and throw out those things that are unusable and piece together what will allow you and help you to move forward in a way that can lead you back through the whole cycle again because I, I realized when I was younger going through some really hard times in my life that I continue to run my head into the same brick wall time and time and time and time and time again as time through this exact process that I'm talking to you about continued forward I realized that hey you know I stopped myself, hey man, how many times are you going to continue to ram your head into that damn brick wall? Why don't you take the lesson, right, which is making the separatio of the situation, right, and going back towards the conjunctio again. And a lot of times I found that by learning the lesson, I was able to sidestep with great results and, and make headway into a situation uh, that helped me to transcend the previous falls that I was making, you know, trying to, 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 to fly high above the old pitfall, you know. So um, an alchemical key to the Vaseca Piscus now and the symbolism that was given show separatio, coagulatio, um, and conjunctio are central to the idea. OK, so with those three um, alchemical processes, 
we can get a deeper, greater understanding of the efficacy and power of the vesica piscis within the psyche and within consciousness. And if we follow uh, and create, we could say through these uh, cluster chart images, right? And I'll throw up the separatio and I'll throw up the coagulatio cluster charts as they will link back with conjunctio, okay? They're going to show you something about this imagery and what it means symbolically and basically may allow you intuitively, if you're intuitive enough to get something from what I've talked about already and from the cluster chart images, what this symbolism means to your psyche and how it can be used even in ways that I'm not speaking of here, you know? Because depending upon your grade of understanding, depending upon your way uh, of, of, of apprehending the light of this uh, symbolism, you will approach it differently, maybe even greater than I. So 